Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Passio. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here today at this phenomenal event with the greatest minds of our time assembled right here at this very conference. My talk today, ladies and gentlemen, is entitled The Cult of Ultimate Evil, Order of Followers, and the Destruction of the Sacred Feminine. And I just want to put this slide up here at the very beginning uh, to set the tone for what this entire presentation is going to be all about, because that is what the order followers of this world are actually taking aim at. They are taking aim at the goddess. They are taking aim at the dynamic of care that is barely still alive in our world. And ultimately, they are the ones who are going to snuff it out if it is to be snuffed out. Before we begin, I always start my presentations with a few warnings, if you will, or caveats, so people know what to expect. I think most of you know what to expect, but, you know, there may be some new listeners out on the Internet that aren't familiar with my work, so I'll just run through this quickly. You will not be seeing or hearing anything new here today in this presentation. As the old saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. And what that ancient phrase actually means is that the truth has always been here. It is eternal. It is up to us to recognize it. It has always been here. It always will be here. And it can ultimately never be destroyed. My presence presentation style has been described, rightly so, by some people as very intense and at times even combative. Some people here today are very likely to possibly be upset or angered by this information. So be it. If that is the case, so be it. Feel those emotions and run with it. The fact of the matter is that the truth itself by its nature, is belligerent because it wages war against all forms of mind control. I don't pre present this information to be liked. I don't present it to be popular. I don't present it to make money. I don't present it to make friends. I don't really even want to do this with my time, as I've told many people in, in the past. I already know this information. I already understand it. I already live it. I already put these principles to work in my personal life. I present publicly because in the time we're living in, there is so much overwhelming ignorance regarding this type of information that the fact that I do understand it and live it places me in a position of moral obligation to speak that, those truths to other people, to help them to understand it, and then apply those principles in their lives as well. Every person who wants to take away real value from watching this presentation should make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things. First, set aside your perceptions of me as the presenter. This includes things like how I look, dress, or sound. Paying attention to such trivialities will distract mental focus away from the message that is being delivered. The information is what is critically important, not myself. Be consciously aware, secondly, be consciously aware of any impulses that you may have to reject the information presented during this presentation solely upon your, based initially upon your initial emotional response to what you are hearing, because you may be angered, because you may get upset by some of the things I'm about to say. Be aware that it is a logical fallacy to try to judge the truthfulness of any given information just based upon how you feel when you first hear or see it. So with those caveats being laid out there at the beginning, let's jump in with the definition of an order follower. What exactly is an order follower by definition? An order follower is a person who does what someone else commands them to do 
and who has therefore attempted to abdicate their free will and their personal responsibility for choosing their own actions based upon correct determination of the morality or immorality of a particular behavior. That is the definition of what an order follower is and does. Okay, so they're just acting on rote based on what someone else told them to do without making conscious judgments regarding whether that behavior is morally right or morally wrong. That's the definition. There are three main types of order followers. I call the first type the abdicators, the people who attempt to abdicate their personal responsibility. These are individuals who do what they are told to do by a perceived superior without first judging for themselves whether or not the action they've been ordered to perform is morally right or wrong. They are attempting to abdicate personal responsibility for that judgment call. Those are probably the largest group of order followers. Most order followers fall into this category. The second group is who I call the well-intentioned, and we're going to talk about intention versus reality later on, the well-intentioned but incorrect. These are individuals who erroneously believe that they have correctly determined the morality of an action that they have been commanded to perform, and so they then for willfully choose to carry it out. They believe that they are doing the right thing, in other words although that belief is not true. It is an incorrect belief. And then there are the people who just don't give a damn. There's something deeply broken in them, possibly genetically broken. <clears throat> These are the psychopaths, whether primary or secondary psychopaths. These are individuals who consciously do recognize the immorality of an action that they have comm been commanded to perform, yet they willfully choose to carry it out anyway, knowing fully that it is wrong and violates someone else's rights. That's who I call the psychopaths. They just don't care, and they're going to do violence anyway, because they just want to. Those are the three kinds of order followers. And I'd like to play a brief interview. This is from uh, Adam Kokesh, who I have tremendous respect for, from his show, Adam vs. the Man. I have tremendous respect for this individual because he is a former order follower who developed a true conscience. conscience. He got out of the cult of ultimate evil and started exposing it. And he's going to interview a member, an active member of this cult, as we will see that it is, uh, a typical order follower. So I'll let this video speak for itself. Hey, what's happening, Staff Sergeant? How you doing? Hey, my name's Adam. Nice to meet you. I was in the Marines. I do a YouTube channel now called Adam vs. The Man. You mind telling me what it's like being here for inauguration? Uh, it's a great thing to be here. Right on. Um, can I ask uh, about what you think of President Obama? Well, I, uh, I support our new leader, and uh, that's pretty much all I really feel about that's that. That's what I'm yeah. talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Support our leader. Hey, I do command that chief goal, oh, Obama. Boy, <laughs> Tell it's your moment to shine. Get off <laughs> so w when you enlisted, you swore an oath to the Constitution, right? Yes. And do you think Obama's policies are constitutional? I don't really follow politics too much. So you swore an oath with your life to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and you have no idea what that means. Hey, right, sounds good to me, sir, if that's the way you want to put it. Really? That's it? That's it. That sounds pretty dangerous. It sounds like following orders without question. Nope, I just uh, do what I'm told by my leaders, so that's pretty much it. I leave the politics to other people. So you do follow orders without question? Uh, from my leaders, yes. Yeah. So if they if, if they told you to to do something that was immoral, you wouldn't you wouldn't question it. You wouldn't wonder what the basis of that was, or where that order came from, or what its real purpose was. You you just do it because someone told you to, and they're they're paying your paycheck. Hey, whatever you want to say, sir. Hey, don't call me sir, I was a sergeant. There you go. I worked for a living. Okay. But I got out and I found out what I, what was you know wrong with following orders without questioning them. And I found out that when I was in Fallujah in 2004, 
with the Marine Corps Civil Affairs team, we weren't really serving the people or protecting people. We were serving the politicians and the banksters and the war profiteers. I mean, doesn't that bother you to, to know that you're a, a pawn in all that and, and that you allow it to happen by just following orders without question? Hey, whatever way you feel, sir. Well, I'm asking how you feel. Well, it's not really important how I feel. Feelings have been conditioned out of you? You're you're a, a soldier now? However you feel, sir. <laughs> well, is there anything else you want to say on the subject for posterity? No, sir. Well, let me tell you, there's... Hey, you got to stop calling me sir, man. All right, sir. Staff Sergeant. Oh, all right. I see how it is. Well, there's an organization called Oath Keepers, and it's about people who, who take their oath to that, to that Constitution seriously and want to make sure that things like what happened in Katrina, where there were soldiers and National Guard troops asked to take away citizens' firearms who were trying to defend themselves, or, you know, troops being used against the American citizens. They want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Would you be interested in, in having a little uh, a, a more understanding of your oath and, and commitment to the Constitution that you swore an oath to support and defend? I'm good the way I am, sir. Really? Doesn't that make you part of the problem? Hey, if there's a problem, I'm not aware of it. Is ignorance bliss? Could be, sir. Could be? I don't think you're as dumb as you make yourself out to be. I think you're playing me off. Might be, sir. You might be. I'm pretty confident in that, actually. All right. You're smarter, aren't you? You know what I'm talking about. Well, I got a job to do, sir. What's your name, Staff Sergeant? Bob. What's your last name, Staff Sergeant? That's all I got, sir. You're a public servant, are you not? Sounds good to me, sir. You don't want any kind of accountability for what you're saying, do you? No, sir. Well, you don't have any name badge on. Special Police, Staff Sergeant Bob. Thank you for your time. I hope you. I hope you'll at least take the advice of an older veteran and think about some of these issues. Have a good day, sir. All right. Appreciate it. Yep. That is a member of a cult. <laughs> Order following, as I trust that everyone in this room just clearly understood from that graphic demonstration is directly opposed to conscience. When that gentleman was asked if he cared about whether he's doing the right thing or not, he said, I just do what I'm told by my leaders. And when asked if he wanted more information about the, the morality of that, those decision-making processes, he responded by saying, I'm fine the way I am. You know? That's the typical order follower. That's the process that's going on in their mind. It's a belief system, not based in reality at all, and certainly not based in conscience. Conscience, ladies and gentlemen, is knowledge. It is not action. It is not behavior. It is knowledge. Conscience, as a word, comes from the Latin prefix con, which means together, and the Latin verb sciere, which means to know or to understand. Hence, to know together. Conscience is common sense knowledge about the difference between right and wrong. It is the common sense knowledge of the objective, knowable difference between right action and wrong action. And people will then ask, well, what is right action and what is wrong action? Isn't that super complicated? Wouldn't that take like lifetimes to understand? No. It's very, very, very simple, actually. Right is that which is based in truth, and hence it is correct. It is in harmony with the laws of morality that exist inherently in nature, what I term natural law, moral law, cosmic law, God's law whatever name you want to use for it, it's the laws of morality and the difference between right and wrong. Actions based in right do not result in harm to other sentient beings. Conversely, wrongdoings are based in illusion and pure belief and fantasy and constructs that only exist in an imbalanced mind. They are not based in truth and therefore they are incorrect. 
They are immoral because they stand in direct opposition to the laws of common sense, to the laws of morality. Actions that are wrongdoings result in harm to other sentient beings. The, big part, the biggest part of the problem we're facing on Earth is that the average human being, certainly not in this room, but the average human being walking around on this planet, does not understand what a right is and cannot give you the simple definition of a right. A right is an action that does not cause harm to another sentient being. If harm is resulting, the action is a wrong. If no harm is resulting to someone else, that action is reserved as a right. And it is quite simply that easy, that simple to understand. Unfortunately, 99% of people don't understand that and therefore they don't exercise conscience. The exercise of conscience is the free will choice of right action over wrong action. Once you've taken in the difference between right and wrong, once the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong according to natural law has been acquired by an individual. And order followers never exercise conscience. They are not acting of their own free will accord. They are attempting to abdicate that free will choice to someone else who they are then just saying, I will follow what you tell me to do. If someone is following orders from anyone else for whatever the reason or intent, they can not be exercising conscience since by definition the exercise of conscience means that someone is willfully and correctly choosing for themselves right action over wrong action out of their own free will. The difference between the institutions of order followers today and all of the order followers that conducted some of the most heinous atrocities that mankind has ever witnessed. Soviet Russia, Mao's China, Hitler's Germany. There's no difference between them. They are just as immoral. They are just as incorrect. They are just as ignorant and they are just as cowardly. And people can get as offended as they want by that. It's n nothing that anybody, however anyone reacts to it, is not going to make that an untrue statement. I'm going to really attempt to offend some people's delicate sensibilities in this section because I'm going to do something that the human ego abhors. And that's make blanket statements, but blanket statements that are nonetheless 100% true. I'm going to make three true blanket statements regarding order followers, all order followers, 100%, zero exceptions ever in the history of the world. These statements have been, are now, and will continue to be true forever. All order followers are bad people. All order followers are bad people. The exit's in the back for some people who are a little too, too offended by it, you know. And here's the totally logical proof of this given by the historian Dr. Robert Higgs. The good cop, bad cop question can be disposed of decisively. We need only consider the following. Every cop has agreed as part of their job to enforce the laws, all the laws, all of them. That is their job. That is what they have agreed to do. Many, too, many of the laws are manifestly unjust or even cruel and wicked. Three, therefore, every cop has agreed to act as an enforcer of laws that are manifestly unjust or even cruel and wicked. The inescapable conclusion based upon pure logic alone, not even any heart-based intelligence, just pure logic by itself, the conclusion invariably is that there are, is no such thing as a good cop. There is no such thing as a good order follower, period, ever and never has been. Order, since no order follower is truly exercising conscience, 
And the order follower will carry out actions that they have been commanded to perform, even if those actions cause harm to other beings. No order follower in the history of the world can be said to be a truly moral human being. They are antitheses of each other. They are diametrically opposed polar opposite conditions. Order following and moral free will choice. They can never go hand in hand. This brings us to the issue of moral culpability when it comes to order followers. The question always arises, who's more morally culpable? Where does the real responsibility or blame lie? In the order giver or with the order follower? Moral culpability is the determination of who is ultimately at fault or deserving of blame for the commission of actions which result in harm or loss to other beings. Culpable as a word comes from Latin culpa meaning blame and it, uh, the word culpable in English means at fault or deserving of blame. There is such a thing as blame. There is such a thing as who is at fault, who brought that resultant harm into manifestation in reality. So who is more morally culpable? And please read the question specifically, who is more morally culpable? I'm not making the statement that neither party is morally culpable. I'm saying both are morally culpable but who is more at fault or deserving of blame when harm results as a result of one group giving an order and another group carrying out those orders? The order giver or the order follower? There's a correct answer to that question. It is not a matter of opinion. The, the way you determine the answer, the correct answer to that question is you ask this question. If each group of people is saying my actions didn't actually bring extraordinary harm into manifested reality. Who's lying and who's telling the truth when it comes down to brass tacks? So here's what bombs raining down on children do in the Middle East, in, con in countries we have no business in, okay? You know, the problem is, you know, the w reason so many people still comport still support actions like this and still support the order followers who do them is the bombs aren't raining down on their children. Okay? So who's lying and who's telling the truth? Well, the painful answer is those politicians aren't lying. Their actions didn't cause that. You could say their words had a part in it and therefore they're still morally culpable, but they didn't actually pull those triggers. They didn't drop those bombs. The order followers did those immoral behaviors. The painful truth, the order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver because the order follower is the one who actually performed the action and in taking such action actually brought the resultant harm into physical manifestation. Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos in our world. It should never be seen as a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of this planet. This is the result of following orders, invariably, to its inevitable conclusion, genocide, mass death, mass graves, people committing themselves to evil that they even know is evil and they give themselves over to it because hey I was just doing what I was told I was just doing my job just following orders I was just following orders or I was just doing my job is never a valid excuse or justification for immoral criminal behavior. And this lame attempt to abdicate one's own personal responsibility should never be accepted as a valid excuse for such criminal behavior. Unfortunately, too many people let people like this off the hook, off the line, because they accept this justification that, oh, you were just following your orders, you were just doing your job. Well, oh, okay, well, that excuse you, excuses you somehow. No, it doesn't. 
It doesn't excuse you of your personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action and never should be accepted as such. The word justification comes from the Latin noun jus, which means law or right in Latin, and the Latin verb facere, which means to make or to create. Thus, the word justification, coming to, with those two root forms together, actually means to create a right, to attempt to create a right which did not actually exist in nature. You're inventing rights. You're saying a wrongdoing can somehow become a right something that you're allowed to do under the laws of morality. So, you know, here's a little internet meme. This is a picture of a criminal who didn't obey the law here on the left side and some other guys who are just following orders, you know. Order followers are ultimately the servants of evil in the world. Evil cannot accomplish its goals or its objectives without people willing to carry out the evil because they were told to carry it out. A great quote by Gandhi, he said, you assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees, talking about the order followers in the world. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance to it means partaking of the evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her whole soul. Beautiful quote. I wholeheartedly concur. I want to talk a little bit about intention, the intention of the order followers. You know, you'll hear a lot of New Agers bring this up. Well, doesn't the intent matter? Doesn't what they actually intended in their mind matter so much? Absolutely not. It's meaningless. Intention, when it comes to carrying out immoral behaviors, is meaningless. You, your behaviors either caused harm to another being or did not cause harm to another being. What you intended has absolutely no bearing on that. The action has all the bearing on that. And the action only. And that's what some, that's what our souls will be judged upon. Okay? That's what we'll judge our souls based upon. And th this is how we, th this gets obfuscated, okay? How reality is actually structured and built, how we experience our reality in this powerful, very simple building block demonstration. It all begins with knowledge. Without knowledge, there is no foundation to understand how reality is built. There is no foundation to understand the laws, the real laws of attraction. This is why the order follower continues to do what they do, because they don't have knowledge or they ignore that knowledge. Okay, they willfully refuse to accept it. Knowledge is the available information, the grammar, okay, all the components that we need to assemble and bring together. Potential knowledge that may be gathered, processed, understood, and then eventually acted upon by individuals. That's the base level of how we create our reality. Without access to that knowledge, we cannot consciously create our reality effectively the way we want to create it without chaos, to create it in an orderly fashion, in a peaceful fashion, in a harmonious fashion. Upon the knowledge step of the reality building process, if you will, and what I'm building here many will recognize is the trivium process, the second step of this process is the understanding phase. Okay, It is the processes that take place in the human mind that are chosen by each individual based upon the available information that they've taken in. So this is where you're processing that data and you're, you're weeding out the inconsistencies and you're coming to an understanding of it. You're, you're grasping how it works. Without that knowledge being present, you can't understand. You cannot move to that second step at all. This is why dark occultists and people who want to keep the world in thrall, in slavery, always try to control the availability of information first and foremost. Because they want to cut people's ability to consciously create reality off at the root. The third step of this trivium process is wisdom. Right action. And you know, you'll notice I put on all the building blocks or lack thereof. You know, without knowledge, there's ignorance. Without understanding, there's confusion. Without wisdom, there is folly. Wisdom, or the, the behavioral stage of the, of the reality creation process, is 
based upon each individual's behavior. Each individual's behavior is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes in step two, which are in turn based upon the quality of the available information they took in in step one. Then we get a result in the real world. We get a manifested result. Is it order? Is it chaos? Is it peace? Or is it destruction? You know, is it life or death? You know, is it what we say we wanted? Or do we get the opposite of what we said we wanted? Suffering. The manifested reality, the quality of the condition with, which manifests in any society is always based upon the aggregate, the collective quality of the behavior within that society. This process is what all order followers do not understand. They do not have any knowledge of how the reality that they are unconsciously co-creating is structured or works. And it is that information is deliberately held back from them, never offered, and they don't seek it out because they're looking to abdicate their responsibility. And we'll get to why that is. They don't understand natural law. This is why an order follower cannot be a good person because of this lack of knowledge. We're ultimately talking about the lack of conscience, which is knowledge. The natural law expressions, it all starts with either love or fear, and it moves down unilaterally through these progressions. If our consciousness is, is, is based in the acceptance of truth, knowledge, and that comes from opening up our minds and hearts to the energy known as love, then we will understand our own inherent individual sovereignty, what I call internal monarchy, being a ruler of the self, a self-master. Okay, Nobody else ruling you, no one else having the right to rule you. What will manifest in the aggregate of society will be true freedom, what I call anarchy, external anarchy, meaning no one outside of the self is attempting to rule anybody else. That's order, ladies and gentlemen. That's the manifested condition called order or good or what we say we want, the absence of self-inflicted suffering. Conversely, if fear is the underlying mo modality of consciousness, we're going to remain in a state of ignorance because that fear is going to drive us to refuse to accept truth. And in that, we're going to go into a state of confusion internally. No ruler at home, no ruler in the, in the kingdom of the self. Internal anarchy is a very bad thing. You need to rule within. This is the kingdom that you have the right to rule. Your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own actions, and nothing else. When we're in that state of internal anarchy or confusion, in the external realm, in our society, control results, or slavery would actually really be a better term. External monarchy, rulership by an elite class. And that's chaos, which is what we have now. You know, we're in this bottom stage here on the far right-hand bottom corner. Manifested evil. These energies, these expressions of natural law always work unilaterally. You cannot jump columns. Once you start with love, you cannot jump over to the right-hand column. Once you start with fear, you cannot jump over to the left-hand column. Okay? The order follower never understands cause and effect, and that's another reason that their intentions are meaningless. Only understanding how reality works, how we are getting the result of what we put out into the universe, often over a time lag, okay? That's the hard part of recognizing the laws of cause and effect. Only when we understand how those dynamics work do we understand we are getting what we have put out there through our own behavior. Every cause has its effect. Invariably, it is law. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Nothing happens by chance. Cause and effect, however, are often separated by time and space, which makes the understanding of the laws of cause and effect sometimes difficult, because as soon as you do an immoral behavior, an anvil doesn't drop on your head from the sky. It would be nice if it happened that way, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. What happens is, as more immoral behavior builds up in the aggregate of society, in the collective of society, of any given society, the more chaos and slavery is going to result in that society. This is called the law of freedom, as I call it. Freedom and morality are directly proportional to each other. 
The order follower also doesn't understand this law of the universe that is inherent to creation and can never be changed. Nothing any being in creation does can ever change this law because it is a natural inherent law built into the fabric of reality. The aggregate amount of truth and morality present in the lives of the people of any given society is directly proportional to the amount of freedom and order in that society. And it is inversely proportional to the presence of chaos, tyranny, and enslavement in that society. More simply put, as morality increases in the aggregate of a society, freedom in the aggregate increases in that society. As the society in the aggregate becomes more immoral collectively, slavery increases in that society and freedom dies in it. And that's why freedom's dying in our society. Because the vast bulk of the human population is making immoral choices. And in the aggregate, that adds up and equals chaos and slavery. That's the key to understanding how reality works, folks, which is why I put that gift of a key out there. That's the overarching law of, of creation and the overarching law of attraction that's operating in the universe. That's the real law of attraction, not the fake nonsense New Age variant of it. Second blanket statement. No order follower ever is a truly intelligent being. No order followers are truly intelligent. Now an order follower can be an intellectual being, but they cannot be an intelligent one. There's a huge difference between the two. Oh, you could, you could know how to uh, solve differential equations and solve complicated physics equations. Yeah, an order follower can do that. But what they lack is heart-based intelligence, the sacred feminine dynamic of true care. Therefore, they can never be holistically intelligent. Left brain intellect does not equate to intelligence. Only when we take in the generative principle of care and compassion that the right brain opens up to us can we become truly holistically intelligent. And since all order followers exhibit both forms of brain imbalance, left brain dominant tendencies when it comes to dealing with those they perceive to be their subjects, and right brain dominant tendencies when it comes to dealing with their perceived superiors, no order follower can be said to have a truly balanced brain or balanced psyche. Therefore, they cannot be holistically intelligent. One way you can actually scientifically prove this is through brain scans, PET and SPECT brain scans, which I touched on early in my work in the What on Earth is Happening series. This is a brain scan from the um, uh, ventral view, the underneath view of the neocortical brain, of uh, a person who is in the state of what's known as EEG coherence, which means global brain balance between hemispheres. The right and left brain hemispheres are operating in a state of balance. Holistic intelligence is at work in this person. That's the typical brain of an order follower. Those black areas are not damaged physical areas of the brain. They are areas of electrochemically deadened activity in the neocortex of the brain scientifically provable with the most advanced type of brain scans available today. And that's what a person with a completely imbalanced brain looks like. In other words, your typical order follower. The reason for this is because the left and right brain hemispheres govern different types of functions when it comes to human capacities. The left brain is the analytical, logical, uh, repetitive and organized and detail-oriented part of the brain, the analysis-oriented part of the brain. That's the intellect, the masculine component. Then there's the feminine component, the intuitive, the compassionate, the nurturing side of the brain, the sacred feminine component of the self, if you will. It's creative, it's imaginative, it's compassionate, it deals with the big picture, intuition, etc., creativity. Without that sacred feminine component, a being is only a half human being at best. And the order follower is generally completely dominated by the left masculine brain hemisphere. 
And hence they are destroying the sacred feminine aspect of themselves. Not just destroying the sacred feminine aspect of care within society because of the immoral behaviors that they take, but they're actually cutting off part of themselves because the masculine and feminine component is not just in male and female. It's These need to be present in balance in all of us, regardless of gender. True intelligence comes from a blending and balancing of both of these dynamic energies. Only when they are operating in unison and harmony, equally, can true intelligence be born. The coming together of the sacred masculine components of the consciousness and the sacred feminine components of the consciousness to give birth to true intelligence. No order follower has true intelligence and never has. Only when you stop being an order follower can you develop true holistic intelligence? Third blanket statement regarding order followers, and get as offended as you like, people, all order followers are cowards. Since no order follower actually possesses the knowledge of conscience in the degree required and the spiritual fortitude in the degree required to refuse to obey the commands from their perceived so-called quote-unquote superiors no order follower ever can ever be said to have true courage true courage versus what people think of as courage are two vastly dynamically different things. True courage is saying no to evil. Be that guy. Be that guy. There's true courage. You know, where for not giving the Nazi salute he could have been shot on sight. You know, to stand up and say, no, I will not comply. I will not go along with the crowd because they're wrong. And if I'm in the minority of one and I'm in the right, I'm going to stand in the truth, regardless of what that means for what happens to me. That's courage. That's courage. <laughs> True courage lies in the lost word, saying no. You want to see where the real hero is in that picture? It's the, the one that didn't show up to partake in the evil. That's the hero. That's the person with real courage. You know, one of my best friends in life, Michael Falsetta, recently said to me, Mark, you're the most fearless person I've ever met. And I said, I refuse to accept that, Michael. I am not fearless. I have fears, many of them. True courage is not the absence of fear. True courage is right action in spite of fear. Next section, and this is where I start to introduce the concepts of what cults are and their methodologies. Modern institutional order followers, and let's just, you know, not mince words or uh, be too verbose here. I'm talking about the police and military. Our cult members. Modern institutional order followers, the police and the military, are cult members. They're not like cult members. They are cult members, provably. To understand what a cult is, we first have to really understand what religion is and means. Religion as a word in English comes from the Latin roots, the Latin verb relegare. Of course, relegare means in Latin to tie back, to hold back, to thwart from forward progress, to bind by tying up, to prevent from going forward. What a false religion is, okay, I, I want to qualify that by saying all false religions. False religions are systems of control that are based in unchallenged dogmatic belief which holds back the progress of human consciousness. It holds back the proper understanding and reception of the laws of morality. The understanding of the difference between right and wrong behavior. That's what a false religion does. 
True religion unites us to something. It reunites us to natural law. It reunites us to the divine spark within all of us. And I would make the claim there's only one true religion, and that's truth itself. Just my take on what real religion is all about. If I had a religion, I would define it as the truth, period. That brings us to the question, what is a cult? If we have to define what a cult is, how will we go about doing that? You know, most people think of cults, and rightly so in these cases, as what we might see in like Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut movie. You know, a powerful elite class, you know, meeting together and doing perverse uh, sexual ri rituals. And that's like kind of much lighter than reality, actually. You know, what they were doing compared to what goes on with the real cults of the world, you know, as you heard at the begin this day w with my good friend Jay Parker. I mean, you know, you want to talk about what cults are really doing to children and, and even their own membership. It goes way beyond what's depicted in any Hollywood variants, okay? So this is Bohemian Grove. This is the kind of strange rituals that the elite of our world, the so-called elite, you know, uh, highest levels of banking and politics and media and entertainment, etc., partake in out in the California Redwoods. But if we had to define what a cult actually is, this would be my best definition of it. It's a system of religious veneration and devotion which espouses beliefs that are dangerous, especially to the lives, rights, and freedoms of those who are not its members. That is what crosses over the line of being a religion just based on belief that holds back your understanding of truth and when it goes into the realm of being a cult. A cult's beliefs are dangerous to others because cult members erroneously believe that they have rights which they actually do not possess in nature. This is what real modern day cult members look like, more so than the images you just saw on the last slide. The overwhelming bulk of the cult members of this world are in these two institutions. How the cult system is maintained is through hierarchy and compartmentalization, visualized in a simple pyramidal structure where knowledge is compartmentalized at the top and the few at the very top are completely in the know. And then all the ignorant followers, the ignorant hordes of followers who are just going along for a paycheck or because they don't want to be singled out or because they don't want to be thought of as by their other peers as, oh, you went against the, the family, you went against the, the, the collective, you know. You rebelled against your programming somehow. These ignorant masses are not in the know at all. They're not given any of the information they need to make truly informed decisions. That's how the cult is maintained. Let's look at some of the cult beliefs of order followers. What are the belief systems of the cult of ultimate evil? Cult belief number one. We place our faith in authority. The cult of order followers rigidly believe that there is such a thing. That it exists in nature that it is the most natural thing that can exist, and that, God forbid, we ever should do away with that concept. Authority is an illusion. It does not exist in nature. Regardless of what anyone believes, it doesn't exist in nature. It exists only within a diseased mind. Authority is based entirely in violence, and it is built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief that some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands while others are their slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the commands of the masters. And that's not my definition. That's what authority is, period. That's what the belief in authority is. That's what the illusory construct in a diseased mind of what authority actually is. It does not exist in nature. It only exists in a mind that is completely, severely imbalanced and does not understand truth or reality at all. What these people believe in and condone, regardless of what anyone wants to call it, I'll call it what it really is, slavery, period. 
And from day one, I told people what my show is ultimately about is that I stand against all forms of slavery. Physical, mental, spiritual, manipulative slavery, soft mind control, any form of it. I want to see slavery in all of its forms abolished forever because it's based in violence, it's immoral, and it results in chaos and suffering. And it's unnecessary because it's self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted through the cult belief system. And so many people who are not direct members of this cult are ancillary supporters of it have this cult mentality as well. And we're going to talk about them in a future section. Cult belief number two. The second belief of the cult of ultimate evil. We have rights that others don't have. The cult of ultimate, of ultimate evil believes in the inequality of human rights. Order followers erroneously believe that they possess rights that others do not. Due to their cult indoctrination, they refuse to accept the truth that everyone has ex the exact same rights. And that no one has any more or less rights than anyone else. The cult of order followers believes that human beings can decide what rights people have or do not have. They think that comes from us, that rights comes from, come from us, that we get to make up rights based in just constructs in the mind, our whims, our likes, our preferences. Rights don't come from human beings. A right is just what I said it is, an action that doesn't cause harm to another. If you performed an action that doesn't cause harm to another, that's a right. If you performed an action that does cause harm to another, that's a wrong. And those actions exist in nature. They are real world natural conditions that we put into effect through our free will. Therefore, they don't, we don't determine whether a right is a right or a wrong is a wrong. That happens inherently as a result of the behavior itself. It's built into creation. It's something that is inherent. We don't get to make it up. So the cult followers also believe that human beings are actually capable of delegating rights, rights which do not exist. They think we can turn wrongs, wrongdoings into rights and say, oh, you're allowed to do that wrongdoing. You're allowed to inflict harm upon someone else and cause suffering. You know, some magical authority can grant that to you. We'll, we'll see how this religious belief works, how this cult belief works very soon. And they also believe that they are capable of revoking rights which actually do exist, preventing someone from carrying out an action that doesn't result in harm to another being. That's what the cult of order followers believes, that they have a right to do that, to prevent right action from being carried out. Cult belief number three of the cult of ultimate evil, the order followers of this world, government is our God. This supernatural entity that can grant rights or revoke rights. It can determine morality based upon its whim, the legislative stroke of a pen. I can write something down and I can make it moral. I could say the next day, oh no, we were wrong about that. That's prohibited now. Now it's immoral and you could be punished for doing it. I mean, if you believe this, folks, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a naive child's mentality, which is what ultimately all these people are. They're people who have never grown up, and they have mommy and daddy issues, as we're going to come to soon. They have parental abandonment issues going on psychologically, whether they are even aware of them or not. I'm going to play a video about the cult of statism, the cult of the belief in government authority. Okay, Just listen to the complete contradiction that you're about to hear from a former United States senator. Let me see if I understand your position. It basically... Would you say that it's wrong for the citizens to initiate physical force against other citizens like an armed robber does? Unless we permit they, but that But it's okay law. for the it's okay for the government to do so. Because the government has been authorized by the people. Okay, but if the government authorized armed robbers to do it, it would be okay? If the government is that foolish to do so, I don't know what kind of country that would be, but uh, that's legal, and if it's constitutional, so be it. Okay, so you think that it's wrong for a citizen, an individual citizen, to initiate force against others to deprive them of their property, but it's okay for the government to do it if the it's majority not, has it elected is, it is that government. Okay, to... It is okay if the government is authorized to do so. The government is authorized to levy taxes 
and the authorization comes from the people. Do the individual citizens have the right to initiate physical force against other citizens that have not initiated or threatened to initiate force against anybody and haven't violated anybody's property rights? They cannot do that because they are not authorized to do so under the right. law. So individual citizens don't have that right. If they don't have the right to initiate physical force against other citizens, could they have properly delegated that right to the government? Oh, yes. They do so right now. Can you properly delegate a right that you do not have? You can give the right to their representatives to make laws that will authorize or make prohibitive certain activities. So you think that you can oh, delegate absolutely. a right that you don't have? You can properly delegate a right that you don't have? You cannot tax your neighbor, but you can authorize me as your senator to vote for a program that will tax your neighbor. Okay, so if you can, you say that a person can properly delegate a right that they do not have, is that correct? Yes. Okay, well, would, I don't have the right torture. to use, I don't have the right to use your home in Hawaii, right? But could I delegate that right to some of my friends? No way. Right, so you really can't delegate a right that you don't have. You have to have the right in order to delegate We're it, right? We're talking about the government here. Right, but you agreed that the individuals do not have but the you, right... But you can authorize the government Right. But did you take agree? take over my residence. Okay, but did you, did, did you agree that the individuals did not have the right to initiate force against the other individuals? They don't have that right. No. So... Although then, some people think they do. Then they could not have delegated that right if they didn't have it. They would delegate authority to us, their representatives, to make laws in their best interest. So even if they don't have the right, they can delegate it to somebody else? To make laws that might right. do that. So then you think that you can actually delegate a right that you do not have. And the individuals do not have the right to initiate force against others. As, I would in, suppose, as individuals? Well, if they get together, then all of a sudden they have the right? If they authorize the government to do so, yes. Well, if, if, if nobody... If they authorize the government to enter into a war and kill people, that's a right. I, I'm, it seems like there's a contradiction there as far as if you say that all legitimate governmental power is derived from the people. You agree that the individual citizens do not have the right to initiate force against other citizens, then it would seem clear that I they cannot we'll just, why delegate don't we just that leave right it, to the government. Why don't we just leave it this way? We disagree. Why don't we just leave it at this? I'm in a cult and government is my God. I feel horrifically sorry for anyone who cannot fully cognize the complete inconsistencies of a brainwashed person like that. If so, whoever cannot see the logical fallacies and total inconsistencies in this person's total perversion of cognitive processes, I, I, I feel they are just as sick as this individual is, if it can't readily be seen. So let's talk about the techniques of cults. How do the cult leaders keep the cult lower down members, the rank and file, in line. They have very strict, rigid sets of techniques that they have employed throughout human history and they don't waver with them because they have always worked. They've worked consistently because people have still not built their consciousness up to a level where they understand how these methodologies of manipulation work. I call this the techniques of cults or how to brainwash willing followers who want to give away personal responsibility for their own actions. And there are four main cult techniques. Isolation, conformity, indoctrination through repetition, and trauma. Isolation, conformity, indoctrination, and trauma. Let's take them one at a time. Cult technique number one, isolation. Probably the single most important technique because it makes it very difficult for anybody to penetrate the collective of the cult, the boundary of the cult. 
You have to physically separate the cult members or the potential cult members from the rest of their community so no reason can be spoken to them as much as that is within your power to do so. Create an us versus them mentality. We are the family. We are the collective. Anybody outside of us is them and they are not us. Demonize the outsiders. Those who don't belong. You know? The civilians. You know? Somebody recently just told me what police and military are calling us are civilian pukes. One of the big names going around within the cult. The civilian pukes. Huh, just like they're cult leaders call them their dogs, their pets, their animals, as we'll get to. Isolation is probably the most important technique. And why? Why is it so? Because you have to cut off the cult members from the knowledge that they could receive from outside of the cult. And therefore, it makes them incapable of changing. Cult technique number two, conformity. Don't tolerate any individuality within the cult. One's old identity has to be completely broken down and reformed. Completely shed and then built back up to something new and different that falls in the rigidly restricted parameters of the cult belief. And you know what? They'll be all too happy to tell you that this is what they're doing to you. The, in the Marines, they tell people, we're going to break you down, boy, and then we'll re rebuild you back up in our image. They're all too open about how they employ these techniques. They use uniforms, uniform, one form, rigidity, uniforms to create sameness in appearance, and they use modes of sameness in speech and behaviors, regimented actions. What this does is this builds up resonance. It keeps people locked in step. And they, they just go along with the behaviors by rote, like a wind-up doll. Cult technique number three, indoctrination through repetition. Rigorous schedules and instructions. Repetitive behaviors doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And repetition is one of the greatest forms of mind control, if not the most powerful form of mind control. They put them through obstacle courses, drills, formations, marching in step, etc. Repeated phrases, chants, and songs being employed to put them in a certain rhythm, a certain vibratory energy. Indoctrinate the mind. Give it the belief system over and over again until they believe it. Keep repeating the lie until it is widely believed. Cult technique number four is broken down in two halves, two parts. There's physical trauma, and then there's mental and emotional trauma. The physical trauma consists of high levels of activity to the point of exhaustion, low sleep time, and disrupted sleep, high carbohydrate intake, and low nutrient intake in the diet. This damages the brain. It puts somebody in a state of weakened resistance. Their body, mind, and spirit are unable to resist the dictates of the cult. They weaken them through these techniques physically. And then they use emotional trauma to weaken the spirit. Verbal and psychological abuse heaped at them continuously, constantly telling them they're not good enough. Unexpected, sudden, or shocking scenarios create trauma, create a situation. Oh, you have to jump up in the middle of the night and respond to this scenario that's happening. A perpetual atmosphere of fear. And as we saw in the natural law expressions, fear can only lead to ignorance, confusion, control, or slavery, and ultimately chaos. That's all it can ever lead to. can't ever lead to any of the good expressions of natural law, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, freedom, sovereignty. can't lead to any of, of those things. certainly can't lead to order and justice in a society. And that's why they employ these four overarching methodologies. And you see, I've used images of the modern day cults. But you know what? 
These are the same with every single destructive religious cult that has ever existed on the face of the earth. The techniques are the exact same, identical. The cult rank and file membership of the cult of ultimate evil, which I'm talking about, the order followers, the police and military, are viciously, symbolically, occultically mocked by the cult, their cult leaders. And I talked about this at Free Your Mind 1 back in 2011 in Philadelphia. I gave a presentation called The Occult Mockery of Police and Military Personnel, where through first-hand experience of being involved in a satanic cult myself with the cult of ultimate evil's leaders, the people who actually direct these cult members, these order followers, being around them in that satanic cult, first-hand from their lips to my ears, when I was a membership of that cult, in, a, in the membership of that cult, they expressed what they think about their order followers, the people who protect them and their agenda. And the only thing they ever call these people is their dogs or their pets. That's it. They look at them as attack dogs on leashes. You'll attack when I tell you to attack, dog. You'll sit when I tell you to sit, dog. You'll sleep when I tell you to sleep. You'll eat when I tell you to eat. And they give them dog tags to wear around their neck. And they put all kinds of dark occultic symbolism all over their brain. The checkerboard floor of the house in Freemasonry represents total ignorance, total unconsciousness. The complete lack of understanding of the difference between right and wrong is what the checkered floor represents. Well, why would the cult leaders wrap it around the brain of their followers? Around the brain, symbolically. And then let's throw an inverted pentagram that represents the destruction of the human spirit and the raising of du dualistic tendencies, duality, confrontation, conflict, us versus them mentality. You know, put that right on the third eye and the crown chakra, why don't we? Yeah, we're not ritualistically mocking anybody who doesn't even understand our language, our symbolic language, no. They call them their dogs, and that's what they're doing, getting to eat their worthless fiat currency out of a trough, out of a dog bowl. The supporters of order followers constitute ancillary cult membership. They are ancillary cult members, secondary members of the cult of ultimate evil. And you know what? There's a whole lot more of them than there are the main membership of the cult. A whole lot who support what this cult does, thinking that they're doing something that is good or can lead to something that is good. This is the exact dynamic that I'm talking about of ancillary cult members, the supporters of the order followers. Because they're my husband or my son or my brother, etc. And you know, you know, not to make this any kind of a gender related statement, but the ancillary followers of the cult are largely women because they're supporting the men who are involved in the cult. The men in their lives, they'll often support blindly. You know, because they don't want to believe they're doing something that is evil. They don't want to confront them on it. And that's what women have to step into a infinitely more powerful role that they have within their capability to change this world through the non-support of these cult members, the non-support of dominators. When they step into, the, into that kind of power, that's when women are stepping into the true sacred feminine power of real care, real heart-based intelligence, and that's where is going to be their power to completely transform this world. But you know, the supporters of order followers are everywhere. Men, women, children, etc. Now he should have obeyed the law. They're crucifying him for a legitimate reason. They're just doing their jobs, just following orders, you know. And of course this is just, it's allegorical. It's about how people just support evil and put down the thing that's actually trying to tell them to do the right thing. You know, destroying conscience, destroying the sacred feminine essence. 
In many ways, the supporters of order followers, the ancillary members of the cult of ultimate evil, are doing more damage to the morality of human society than the order followers themselves, especially due to their vastly greater numbers. Order followers and their supporters are the true destroyers of this world. Unfortunately, that statement is true. People always want to pass the buck. They want to point fingers outward. They never want to do this. See, that's what I had to do to get out of the cult. Couldn't do this. Couldn't say it was you. Couldn't say, couldn't say it was the cult leaders. I had to recognize at a deep fundamental level of my being that I was the problem. And I was wrong. You know, we want to pass that responsibility on to, oh, the people in the upper echelons of power, the politicians, which don't, aren't really in the upper echelons of power, they're the puppets. But they think of the politicians as the one who are there, the international bankers, you know, even the, the actual cult members, the real legitimate cult members that are part of satanic, the satanic, uh, you know, worldwide network of Satanism and dark Luciferianism. Ultimately, those aren't the people who are destroying the world. Are they taking a role in it? Without any question. Should they be held responsible? Without any question. Who's ultimately bringing that harm into physical manifestation? The people who follow their commands. The people who enact their agenda through their behavior. These are the creators of the dark new world order. The order followers are ushering in the new dark age. Not the order givers. The order givers play their role. But the order followers are, are the ones who bring the harm into actual manifested reality. Order followers are the destroyers of the sacred feminine dynamic of care. This is the background for my entire presentation. I brought it up as the first slide for people to contemplate at the beginning. They are taking aim at the goddess principle, the non-aggression principle, true care the compassionate and nurturing aspects of the being. That's what they're destroying within themselves and then through the violence and the slavery that they're enacting and supporting through their behaviors, they're destroying that dynamic of care outwardly in a wider sense in society. And this is the state of the sacred feminine dynamic of the people of the earth. The goddess is weeping, ladies and gentlemen. And she needs to be rejuvenated desperately. And we need to be the people to help rejuvenate that sacred feminine energy. Let's talk about the solution. What is to be done about this? What can be done about this? Is there a solution? Yes, there is. The solution is the people right here in this room. and those who these words will reach and resonate with wherever you may be watching from. The solution is what I call the great work, or the infiltration of the cult of ultimate evil. We need to infiltrate the cult. We need to break the first technique of cults, isolation. This is where most people get a little timid, a little afraid. You want me to speak what you're talking about here to people involved in the police and the military? That's the only solution. That's the only way we're going to get out of this mess without bloodshed. What is the great work? The great work of truth, love, and freedom. You know, a, a new kind of symbolic seal, a symbolic sigil, if you will, that communicates everything that is of ultimate importance. The, the light of the creator, the light of natural law. The understanding of conscience, what that eye ultimately, ultimately represents. We need to stop thinking about that as the dark occultist, the dark Illuminati. We need to take that symbol of the all-seeing eye back because the Illuminati are seated in this room. We are illuminated with the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong behavior. You know? That's what that eye ultimately represented throughout history. 
To do the great work is to do the hardest work there is to do. It is to try to move the human race into uncharted territory, into the unknown country, into a place that many fear to go because they've gotten so comfortable in their slavery. The great work is the arduous task of influencing others. Okay, and this happens once you've become illuminated with the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. You've got to start there first. You've got to get your head straight. You've got to get your soul straight. Then you can assist with others. But that's what the great work is. The great work begins once you've healed yourself. Then you could start influencing others. That's doing the great work. It's the arduous task of influencing others to abandon their false religions, the dogmatic and dangerous beliefs which hold back the progress of consciousness by impeding the reception of truth and natural law. Doing the great work is to help others to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority and government that they have actually been supporting and condoning the legitimacy of violence and slavery and that they were immoral for having done so. This is the very reason that the great work is so difficult to do and why it is so unpopular why so few people on this planet are actually engaged in doing it. We need to increase the numbers by not the thousands, not the tens or hundreds of thousands, but by the hundreds of millions is the number of people that need to be doing the great work. Involved at the highest level of doing the great work is our own deep understanding of the psychological factors that are at work in the order follower. Because if we don't have that knowledge, how could we possibly help them to heal and overcome this condition of being indoctrinated into a cult? So we have to understand where their mindset is. Why are they acting in the capacity as order followers? What's going on in their mind and soul that's making them want to behave this way? And this is what I call the tree of evil, okay? It's willful ignorance, but that's just the top portion of the tree, the, the, the leaves and the little twigs. Then we go to the branches, the refusal to own one's personal responsibility, the fear of personal responsibility. That's at a deeper level of the imbalanced psyche. Then we go deeper into the darkness, deeper into that world of dark matter that needs to be drudged up and and transmuted you know the the long dark night of the soul the shadow material if you will the trunk of the tree is self-loathing self-hatred and the reason these people hate themselves is because they have a very deeply instilled lack of self-respect and self-esteem and there's often an overarching underlying reason for that because they have parental abandonment issues, which is what, what I call the roots of the tree of ultimate evil. Understanding those deep underlying psychological, often unconscious or subconscious psychological roots is where we need to go. And parental abandonment issues lies at the very, very base, at the very heart, if you will, of the psychological factors that make order followers want to continue to be order followers. They are looking for a family in proxy for one that did not exist or did not help them to become a better being. They have mommy issues and daddy issues, parental abandonment issues, whether physical, mental, psychological, emotional, or spiritual abandonment issues by their parents. And therefore, they are looking to fulfill that psychologically by proxy with a family, a collective family that basically acts as their new identity. And unless we understand that that dynamic is at work and where their mindset is at is, in a to is that of a tortured child. And what they ultimately need is healing of that dynamic, transmutation of that dynamic by engaging with them and helping them to understand these psychological factors that are taking place within them.
Until we commit to engage in that work, do not expect it to change. Expect it to get worse. Because when these factors are not dealt with at a conscious level and healed at a conscious level, they eat us at a subconscious level. And eventually that subconscious level, those demons come into the real world and they eat us there too. And that's what's happening. Um, we'll look at these dynamics one at a time. Willful ignorance. This is what doing the great work right now at this point in history should probably be probably make most people feel like. Okay? We're the ones who know what's going on in our conscious and a lot of other people around us are asleep. But you have to battle through that condition through willful persistence. Persistence is required to do the great work. Even if this is people's condition, you speak the truth to them anyway. You plant seeds that could blossom at a later point in time once they've seen a little bit more and grown a little bit more. Never stay silent when it comes to issues of right or wrong. You have to speak that truth out into existence, into the universe. The fear of personal responsibility. Again, the abdicators, the biggest group of order followers. This is what they don't want. You heard the, the typical order follower that Adam Kokesh interviewed. You know, you're trying to you know, abdicate that personal responsibility, aren't you? And he says, eh, you know, sounds about right. Par for the course. Just admitting it. He doesn't, he doesn't want that obligation on him. Well, you know what? doesn't matter. It's on you whether you want it or not. An individual's personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action for themselves is always their own and can never be quote-unquote given away to someone else. One can only make the claim, the erroneous claim, that they are abdicating personal responsibility for such moral decision-making to someone else. You can't actually do that in reality, in nature. You can only make the claim that you're doing it. And it's a false claim at that. It can never actually be done in reality. More simply put, an individual is always responsible for their own actions. There are no cop-outs, pun intended. You cannot pass the buck to someone else. I love David Icke's quote on this from one of his early books. He said, accept responsibility for yourself and your actions, thoughts and words. You alone make choices. You alone are answerable to the consequences of your behavior. The feeble excuse that your boss required it, the establishment expected it, holds no truth or justification. What is the point of having principles if you allow others to dictate your behavior? At the end of the day, you will judge your performance and the contribution you have made to creation. It will not be based on what another expected of you or what you did because you felt trapped. There are no cop-outs or excuses for immoral behavior. We have that personal responsibility on us whether we accept it, want it or not, or understand it or not. Self-loathing is the next psychological dynamic that keeps order followers in the positions that they are in. Self-loathing is one of the main underlying psychological condition that causes people to attempt to abdicate their own personal responsibility to exercise conscience and to fall into patterns of order following and justification. Just as it is not possible for an order follower to truly be exercising conscience, it is not possible for an order follower to truly love themselves. Not possible. No one who is actively involved in the dynamic of order following can be an individual who truly loves themselves. At some core psychological, spiritual level of their being, they are engaged in self-hatred. Self-loathing is created when an earlier trauma technique of the cult has been suppressed and buried into the subconscious mind instead of being confronted, dealt with, and healed directly. Such trauma could take the form of feelings of inadequacy, whether real, suggested, or imagined. And that brings us to parental abandonment. That's what's creating those feelings of inadequacy. See, this image is what's known as a golem a being that isn't actually imbued with a soul but can perform rote behaviors. 
And it's holding this sign that says, I have suffered, and therefore I shall cause suffering. And that is the path to slavery. That is the mindset of the perfect slave. Anyone who wants to just continue to inflict harm and suffering just because they've gone through harm and suffering themselves is putting themselves into a deeper prison. The only thing that can ever heal self-loathing is self-respect. The word respect itself comes from the Latin prefix re, meaning again, and the Latin verb spectare, meaning to look at. Only self-respect can heal self-loathing and therefore help to put an order follower on the path to conscience. Working with the shadow material of the self is some of the most difficult work one can ever do. And that's why most people turn around and run away from it a million miles an hour in the opposite direction. Because looking in that mirror is the most difficult place to look. And when I got out of the cult that I was involved in, it took long, hard hours of self-introspection and endless, what seemed like endless days of suffering that would never end because I had to keep delving into that shadow material and working with it and saying, hey, you caused this. You're a part of this condition. You're a part of the continuation of this evil. And you have to change what's going on in here and here if anything out there is going to change. And most people don't want to do that work. That's what real respect is about. That's when I finally developed self-respect. It means to take another look at yourself. That's what you're respecting, looking at again, the self. All of these psychological conditions, willful ignorance, self-loathing, refusal to accept personal responsibility. It all comes down to the being is still acting at an inner level like the abandoned child because they did not receive the support from their parents, from their community, etc. And they're looking to the cult belief system as the proxy parent that they never really had fully developed. That relationship was never fully truly developed. Which is why this connects so deeply in with Len and Honor's work, I can't even tell you. Conscious parenting. Good parenting is so big a part of the solution. You know? It's all about ending the abuse victim cycle that is so, uh, so much a huge part of cult behavior. The cult inflicts the trauma, and then the cult member. They grow up traumatized and they continue to inflict the trauma. It's an endless loop. Unless the one who has undergone the trauma through help, often it has to happen through help because they're so traumatized and victimized that they can't do it on their own. That's what this, this is the support system that they need. Those who are going to reach out and do that great work with these people, you have to be that support system for these people to help them to go through that narrow pathway to healing where the experiencer of trauma is finally healed through applied knowledge, care, and will. And most of all, through the sacred feminine dynamic of care. Cult members often have a fear of chaos, of what would happen if this thing I've always known and always been a part of would suddenly be gone. How would I live? What would be my identity? How would we do things that we've been doing you know, with this system in place if it wasn't, wasn't in place? True freedom, ladies and gentlemen, includes infinite possibilities. No better definition of true freedom in my book. By definition, infinite possibility includes the possibility of chaos manifesting. We cannot fear that possibility. The possibility of the manifestation of lower orders or small amounts of chaos taking place in our world has to be, must be embraced without fear. Or even, not necessarily without fear, but again, with courage. Accepting, even if you fear that, that's a contingency and you'll work through it. You'll exercise right action in spite of that fear, in spite of that possibility for chaos. The manifestation of chaos can be a powerful teacher which brings us to the painful but often but which brings us the painful but often indispensable lessons of what we should not do.
the apophatic lesson. Understand what is a right by understanding what is not a right. Understanding what was the right path to go down. If you go down the wrong path and you make a mistake, you have to be able to consciously recognize that, admit that you were wrong, turn around and get back on the right path. That's what really understanding the self is all about. That's what really having true self-respect is all about. The ability to admit that you were wrong and learn from your mistakes. Ultimately, the fear of this idea, it can never work out if we do things differently. The fear of the possibility of chaos equates to the fear of true freedom. We have to shed that fear if we want to move forward. And we have to help the order followers shed that fear. Through their fear of the possibility of chaos, order followers advocate the legitimacy and the continuance of authority and government. And therefore, they are actually advocating the legitimacy and continuance of violence and slavery. They think they can get rid of those conditions by what they continue to do, when what they continue to do can only continue to create those conditions. Pure logic, ladies and gentlemen. Those who believe that authority is necessary and that it must continue have actually been duped into believing that human slavery is necessary and must continue in order to prevent chaos. Violence and slavery can not prevent chaos because violence and slavery are chaos. The last section I call Becoming Moral, Intelligent, and Courageous, Quitting the Cult. And I'm here today announcing I'm going to create a new campaign as part of what on earth is happening. And it is going to be called the Quit Your Cult campaign. We have to make this almost a mantra. You know, so far to date, I'm going to tell you my tally that I've racked up. Two. I got two. <laughs> you know, it may not be that impressive of a number, but it's a start, right? You got to start somewhere. Former order followers, two former order followers, have communicated to me that it was directly because of the information I've put out regarding natural law and morality that they quit the cult of ultimate evil. We need the return of the sacred feminine energy, which is the dynamic of true care, nurturing, and compassion. You know, um, last year, uh, two years ago at the Free Your Mind conference, it, back in 2013, I gave a lecture called New Age Bullshit and the Suppression of the Sacred Masculine, which is about how the New Age religions ultimately want to create a uh, dynamic of not taking action, of suppressing the masculine, the sacred masculine dynamics of the personality. What this lecture is all about are the forces that are trying to suppress the sacred feminine aspect of the consciousness and personality. The sacred feminine, or the lost principle as I refer to it, is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and most importantly the driving force of our actions. Therefore, care can be seen as the ultimate generator of the quality of our experience. This principle has been often referred to as the generative principle, the creative principle. The word generative is derived from the Latin verb genere, which means to create. What we care enough to put our will behind, what we care enough, what we use the sacred feminine care, enough to put our will behind, the sacred masculine action of will, dynamic of will, is what ultimately gets created in our world. This is the real law of attraction, the real law of manifestation. The world is the way that it is today, sadly, because most people do not care enough, even if they say they want things to be different, to change the world 
through their actions. This is why the dark occult, the cult of ultimate evil, the order givers of the cult of ultimate evil engage in a ceremony yearly, a symbolic ceremony called the cremation of care, immolating care symbolically. And their order followers continue to do it right here in the real world, not the symbolic world, the very real world of behaviors. There's two principles that constitute enlightenment, and we need to engage both of them if we're going to see the return of both the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine principle is the principle of non-aggression, the non-aggression principle. The first pillar of enlightenment is this sacred feminine principle. It's also called the non-aggression principle. It states, very simply, do not engage in violence. Violence is the immoral initiation of undue physical force which one did not ha does not have the right to take against their fellow being. In other words, do not immorally initiate non-rightful use of physical power to coerce, constrain, or compel the rightful physical behavior or free will choice of other sentient beings. Don't engage in violence. Along with that, wedded to that, in union, in sacred union with that is the sacred masculine principle of self-defense, which I talked a lot about at last uh, for your mind, for your mind too. The second pillar of enlightenment is the sacred masculine principle, also called the self-defense principle. This principle states sentient beings have the inherent right to use force to defend themselves from violence conducted upon them by another. Never to initiate that force, but to use it in response to violence that has been waged against them in proportion to that violence. That's the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. True enlightenment is the sacred union of both of these principles. The sacred feminine principle of non-aggression combined with and wed to the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. Only when we create that sacred union between the sacred masculine and sacred feminine within each of us are we going to see real world change happen. This is the alchemical wedding as it has been referred to as. And it's beautifully, symbolically depicted here on uh, the, uh, the tarot card, The Lovers. Once again, I just want to reiterate the powerful role especially that women can play in this sacred union of bringing forward the care and the compassion to help transmute the, the, the consciousness and the mindset of the order followers. Because, let's face it, these order followers who are really bringing this harm into manifestation are largely men doing the bidding of their, uh, you know, cult leaders. Okay, it just happens to be there, men are the physically stronger of the genders here on earth of our species and therefore they're groomed for that role, the out of control masculine aspect, the dark masculine aspect. But women can play the powerful role of transformers if they step into that courage and they challenge the cult of ultimate evil, challenge its validity. On its face, it needs to be challenged. It needs to be recognized as inherently illegitimate authority and government and the violence that they conduct. So women can help men to break, who are involved in that cult to break free if they step into that courage and they step into that sacred feminine dynamic. Then that sacred feminine energy can drive the sacred masculine energy. Because care ultimately has to drive the will. This is what was meant by the phrase, love is the law, love under will. Love has to be the foundation. Higher consciousness has to be the foundation upon which you build the sacred masculine will. So the sacred feminine has to be the foundation. That's true care. Then you could build the true will, the sacred masculine dynamic upon that foundation, that sacred feminine dynamic of love. The sacred feminine drives the sacred masculine action. And how ultimately the cult followers, the order followers of the cult of ultimate evil, are going to have to break their mental bondage is through the use of the lost word. A very powerful concept in my work, which comes from the esoteric tradition of Freemasonry, as I will describe here. 
The lost word is a concept in esoteric Freemasonry, which represents a state of consciousness that has been largely lost to the majority of human beings. In order to speak the so-called lost word, a human being must work upon themselves in order to achieve a state of non-contradiction between their thoughts, emotions, and actions. In such a state of unity consciousness, th that being has truly come to understand the self and the working operations of natural law, moral law. And in doing so, they've deeply realized the objective difference between right and wrong action. Or, as these concepts are referred to in Freemasonry, light and darkness, respectively. Light is truth and right action, and darkness in, in Freemasonry is ignorance and wrong action. And uh, I'll just go back a slide. You'll notice the, the G, okay? The G stands for the generative principle, the sacred feminine principle that has to drive right action, the compasses, compassion, has to circumscribe our behavior, be the actual boundary conditions through which we operate in the world. Beautiful symbolic allegory if Freemasonry is properly understood. In the enlightened state of consciousness that is generated through the knowledge of natural law, conscience in other words, a human being is finally able to step up and speak the lost word, which is no. No is the lost word. No is the word of all power. We reclaim all of our power as sovereign beings when we say no to evil, when we say no to authority, when we say no to someone who is trying to tell us what to do against our better judgment and against what we know to be right. Okay? Only when we say no to those who would claim to be our owners, to those who would claim that it is they who will decide which rights we have or do not have, do we stop externalizing our power to anyone outside of ourselves and in doing so reclaim all of our natural rights. Sadly, very, very few people in our world have the knowledge, the care, and most importantly, the courage that is required to do this. See, that's the courage that the order follower currently lacks. They can only develop that courage to go out of the cult through the lost word of saying no to evil. Unfortunately, since so many lack that courage, that is why the all-powerful lost word is considered lost to humanity. But we can reclaim it. We can reclaim it through the knowledge of our rights, through the knowledge of right versus wrong behavior. Those who don't know will never say no to evil. See, the lost word is not only no and o, but it is also no, K-N-O-W. Knowledge is the transformer that we need to use to change the modality of consciousness that the order followers are in. When we know the difference between right and wrong through conscience, then we will step up and say no to evil. That is my recommendation to the order followers. You know, this is an internet meme I found. Just say no to gangs. I couldn't have said it any better, or maybe I could have. What they need to do is just say no to cults. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the principles that I personally live my life by is never give someone else advice that you haven't followed yourself. Well, you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I'm about to give some really important advice to all the order followers out there today. And I can do it because I followed that advice and I already did it. Quit your cult. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention. Mark Passio.